All right, welcome back. Now, one thing I forgot to mention when I, when I was talking about H.R. Giger was I forgot to show a couple important images. This one right here, and I do want to mention this. This is uh, from the movie Prometheus that was based on one of H.R. Giger's paintings. This is the image from Prometheus, and here's his painting right here. I just really wanted to show that because I have always liked this painting. And it's another one, H.R. Giger picture I wanted to show as well. So, uh, moving right along now, I talked about H.R. Giger. I'm going to talk about another artist. Move. This is an artist who did a lot of album covers, actually was a musician in a band, and then later he started doing more and more album covers for bands. And that is Rodney Matthews. And here's one of his right here. I've always liked this image. He put out a calendar in the mid-70s that was actually pretty popular. I believe he still puts out a calendar to this day. But uh, you may have seen it. Now you go to any comic book convention or anything like that, you'll see him. But uh, yeah, as a quite popular. But I, I think his stuff is just great. There's another one right here. You can tell that Rodney Matthews is and has been inspired by Roger Dean, but he didn't copy him. He definitely put his own spin on that kind of a painting, that kind of a look. could sort of see that with this one right here. We do a number of different album covers for a number of different bands. This one right here is with the band Magnum. I do want to show this. He also did some stuff for the band Praying Mantis. He did some stuff for Diamond Head, which I'll show in a minute. But uh, there's another one he did. This one's called uh, Chase the Dragon. I like this one quite a bit. I, I like a lot of his stuff. I, I think it's great. Very distinct style. How he did trees. The dragon. Looks cool. Or There's one. Fortunately, this image is a little small, but he had done this one for the band Diamond Head. And uh, this is based on the Elric Saga. He would do a lot of stuff based on the Elric Saga. But, uh, yeah, I really liked his stuff. Did some stuff for Nazareth. Uh, like I said, Magnum. Just a number of different bands. And really cool artist. A lot of great stuff. Now, this next artist I'm going to talk about is an artist by the name of Hannah Stauffer. Now, Hannah Stauffer is the daughter of Marty Stauffer. And for those who don't know, Marty Stauffer used to host a show back in the 80s called Wild America. And I have to confess right now, when I was a little kid, I wanted to be Marty Stauffer. I mean, I was a big fan of Wild America. He would go different places, film wildlife. Yeah, I was just a huge fan of what he had done and the show was actually quite popular it was on for a while i believe they even made it into a movie but uh, in the movie from what i know i dealt with like his early life and getting started as a wildlife film photographer but yeah definitely a great show i came across something he had done not too long ago where he was talking about, I think it was like getting into the film industry or getting movies and projects made, and he was swearing in the video. And, you know, that's kind of funny to think of that because the way the image the guy had, he was kind of like a Mr. Rogers with a beard in a lot of ways. So it was kind of strange to hear him swearing like that. But, uh, Anyways, his daughter, Hannah Stauffer, has been an artist for a while. I believe she lives in San Francisco. 
and she has a number of different paintings she did. When I first found out that Marty Stauffer's daughter was an artist, I just kind of assumed that she probably did kind of run-of-the-mill wildlife paintings, and I was completely wrong. Her stuff definitely has a lot of depth to it, a lot of, you know, re really stuff he hadn't really seen before. I'll show it right here. There's one of them. I was really quite surprised to see this, you know. Like I said, I was just expecting regular wildlife paintings. And this stuff is just like kind of on another level in a lot of ways. I almost say there's something like spiritual about it. There's another one, kind of more like a collage kind of thing. There's a lot in here. A lot of animals, a lot of wildlife. Should do a lot of like snakes. I know she had done some work with a snowboard company, but also a number of other companies as well. She's on murals. I believe that she did a mural in Mexico, I want to say. But this kind of really captures the essence of what she had done. I believe this is a watercolor. As you can see, it's kind of simple, but yet at the same time, it's very profound. At least, that's kind of what I take from it. Simple, but there's something profound about it as well. More and more of her images. There's another one. Some of it kind of has a I don't know, maybe kind of like a doom metal appearance. I mean, there's been a number of different artists that have sort of been doing a lot of like 70s throwback kind of styles, and I really like that. Some of it is featured on doom metal album covers, especially an artist that I'll talk about in a bit. He does a lot of stuff like that. But, uh, yeah, might have saved the best for last. Really like this one a lot. But uh, that's Hannah Stauffer. So now I'm going to move back to talking about some more of the uh, TSR artists. More of the uh, Dungeons and Dragons stuff. Right here, I want to talk about this is uh, the work of Clyde Codwell, one of the more recent ones. I'll talk about the other ones too, like Jeff Easley and Larry Elmore. This right here is Clyde Codwell. If you've picked up the second edition Dungeons and Dragons books, you've probably seen this stuff. I know this was on the cover of the. Forgotten Realms book. But yeah, I always really liked his art and other art that I'll show in just a moment. Now this one you're a gamer, you can't do have seen. This one's pretty famous. I almost want to say this was in, might have been in one of the monster compendiums, or it was in one of the books. It has a picture, you know, in the book to kind of get you in the spirit of playing, you know, it definitely does.
And another one, I believe this is his. It's not let me know, but uh, might have been a little bit of a mix up here or there. But yeah, just feel free to let me know if something's out of place by all means. Okay, now on to Larry Elmore. Larry, Larry Elmore, of course, is famous for his work with Dragonlance. He was hired by TSR around 1982, as was Jeff Easley. He was hired around that time, too. Larry Elmore would stay with the company for... Yeah, 1982. So, yeah, he would stay with the company for about 10 years, from what I understand. And he actually has some uh, stuff on YouTube where he's talking about his artwork and the approach he took. He's a very outgoing guy. You know, not all, not all artists are like that, but he's very outgoing, talks about his techniques. In fact, he even has this video where he's in what appears to be almost like a doctor's office. It's just like a small room. There's not a lot of people in the room which surprises me because he's such a legend and he's talking about you know the various techniques he uses and you know he very quickly in a very short period of time draws these like warriors and this I believe it's a dwarf and he does this these drawings very fast and they're very good and yeah it's very like kind of you know low-key atmosphere not a lot of people there so really kind of surprised me and some of the people in the audience didn't even really seem to know much about who he was so but yeah he's definitely a legend in this fantasy art it's another one of his if you're familiar with dragon lance and you've played these games you would be familiar with this these images i'm showing you but if you played Dungeons and Dragons and all that, you were kind of inundated with a lot of great artwork. Larry Elmore is one of them. In fact, I became a huge fan of Game of Thrones, but I wasn't really that big into Game of Thrones initially. What got me into Game of Thrones is the fact that if you'd watch it, a lot of the still images of Game of Thrones just look like they could easily be Larry Elmore paintings. And that was what got me into Game of Thrones, the visual of it. Then I became hooked, but at first I didn't really like it as much. But yeah, after a while I got into it. And it was because of the visuals initially. It, was, it had that Larry Elmore appearance. Really, a lot of what you saw in Game of Thrones, the still images, you know, if you paused it at any time, looked like it could easily be a Larry Elmore painting. This one, quite a famous one right here. It's uh, one of his lizard men right over here. Yeah, but I'm pretty sure this is... This might have been Jeff Easley. It might have mixed in with there, but... Uh, there's another... Undeniably, Larry Elmore, right here. It's another one. Another one right here. Here's another Larry Elmore Dragon Lance one. Now I'm not sure. I, this painting's kind of funny because, you know, you have this guy. Looks like he's been like injured by a dragon, maybe near death. So you know, I, you think this guy's probably having a horrible day, but then yeah, at the same time he's surrounded by four beautiful women. <laughs> so I thought he's either having a great day or a terrible day. I'm not sure what. But, it's a classic Larry Elmore painting right there. So, yeah, I almost want to say this one I showed. I want to say this is Jeff Easley, actually. And not Larry Elmore. But, uh, 
Yeah, somehow that worked its way in with those pictures I had. But uh, as long as I'm talking about Jeff easily, I'm going to show his artwork next. Again, some great stuff. Another one. This was actually on the cover of the second edition player's handbook. You know, probably would recognize it if you saw it. <clears throat> this, this was the cover of the uh, Dungeon Master's Guide. I've always really liked this one. This is just a great, it's probably one of my favorite pictures of a wizard. Got a wizard encountering a dragon. Looks like some sort of a combat scenario. Another great one right here. A couple classic images right here as well, as you've probably seen if you're a gamer at all. Another one I've always liked a lot. Two dragons in combat. Another one with a warrior. There's another one more like a Greyhawk. I believe this was the cover of the Greyhawk book. Yeah, for those who don't know, Greyhawk was a campaign setting. It was medieval England D&D. It was medieval England. Another wizard. Dragon one right here. Got another one. Okay, so that was uh, Larry Elmore. I mean, I'm sorry, that was Jeff Easley, and uh, yeah, Larry Elmore was the one before that. The one I just did was Jeff Easley. Now Jeff Easley would start off at TSR in '82, and he would be there for about 20 years, you know, through the Wizards of the Coast buyout. When Wizards of the Coast bought out TSR, he then went to work for Wizards of the Coast for a little bit. And he did design some Magic the Gathering cards. So there are some Magic the Gathering cards that have been designed by Jeff Easley. So now this next artist I want to talk about... I've been a fan of for a while. I always thought this guy did some cool stuff. This guy is kind of the king of the thrash metal album cover. Even though he's claims to not be a big fan of the music, he's done some great album covers for these bands. You know, but like I said, yeah, he claims not to be a real big fan of the music. So he's more of a punk fan. But he's done a lot of these thrash metal album covers. A lot of them will show corrupt politicians like this one. There's another one he did. Yeah, it's kind of some kind of dystopian type stuff. Images that'll depict maybe nuclear war. There's one by the band Nuclear Assault. There's an, um, another one by a band called Guillotine. Shows a number of politicians. These are obviously very recognizable ones. Not made up ones. I mean, these are... The name of this album is called Blood Money more of his images do a lot of like skeletons and zombies and various corpses it's another one he did also has that kind of fun kind of thrash feel to it i think this one it's one that kind of shows sort of a uh apocalyptic one but with a what appears to be some sort of a politician maybe i don't know Again, like I said, a lot of his stuff will have, like, these corrupt-looking politicians in it. 
saw. I'm going to show the uh, one he did. Now, I said before in another video that a lot of these artists, they became famous when they did sort of a uh, major album cover for somebody, and it just kind of opened up a lot of doors for him. Well, Ed Repka is no exception to this. He did this album cover, and he got tons of work after doing this album cover. And that right here would be Megadeth, and it was the uh, Peace Cells album cover that he did for him. That really catapulted him to get a lot more jobs once he did that. You know, a lot of artists have that. You know, there's that one thing they did after they did it. You know, they just became pretty famous, and everyone wanted a cover by them. There's one of them. Here's the one he did for, uh, like I said, Megadeth, Peace Cells. It's also the one next to it is the uh, Rust in Peace album cover. You know, he would do a lot of stuff for Megadeth. Also did some stuff for the band Death. There's a lot of them, Spiritual Healing. This guy he brings it back to the time, maybe late 80s, when you'd see a lot of this kind of stuff on TV, these faith healers. I know there was another guy by the name of Benny Hinn who was doing this. Not sure if he's still around or not. I haven't really seen a lot of that sort of thing on TV in a while. Another one he did for the band Death. Another one he did. by the name of Municipal Waste. But, uh, yeah. So, okay, that was Ed Repka. Now, <clears throat> we're moving right along. I'm going to talk about the next artist. And, uh, this one is one that I've always liked. He's uh, been around, his work's been around for uh, many, many years because he was born in, I want to say, the 1830s or 40s in France, kind of around the uh, French-German border. And the artist I'm talking about is Gustave Dorier. So got to include some Gustave Dorier. He was also a prodigy, like Fritzetta. You know, he did some great work when he was very young. Also a prodigy. And he would go on to add a lot of illustrations for books. That is what, that's what he's most famous for. But he would do paintings, too, and other things. I think he might have even sculpted as well. Some of these artists, they would do all of it. He might have been one of those, but... He's most famous for these. You know, this looks like the, uh, you know, a biblical painting right here. The angels getting cast out of heaven, I believe it is. There's another one he would do. I like this one. I like this one a lot. This is the Leviathan the biblical Leviathan creature that's mentioned. I believe it's mentioned in the book of Job, if I'm not mistaken. And you could correct me if I'm wrong on that. But I think it was the book of Job that talked of the Leviathan. Uh, yeah, he uh, actually originally... Uh, got his start, or he really became, he became famous. What made him famous were, were the illustrations that he did for the Divine Comedy that had come out. I want to say it was around 1861. 
he did the illustrations for this and that really catapulted him to fame the illustrations were you know of course they were good but they he, they really brought him to a lot of people's attention There's another one he did there's a lot of biblical drawings he would do this is David after he had slain Goliath another one of his Okay, so that right there is Gustave Dorier. Okay, now, now here's another artist that I'm a big fan of. This is an artist by the name of Adam Burke. There's a lot of album covers. There's a lot of album covers in the doom metal genre. You'll see a lot of his stuff. And uh, <clears throat> I think they're great. He really has a great style. You could tell he is influenced by other artists, and I've read some stuff about him, and he does talk about being influenced by a lot of the stuff I like. And a lot of the stuff I showed you already in these videos are things that he's influenced by. He's influenced by all those TSR artists. He's been influenced by Fritzetta, other fantasy artists. I mean, a lot of the stuff I showed is the stuff that he's into, and you could tell when you look at his art that he's influenced by a lot of that stuff. But he was actually in a band, from what I understand, and he had designed their album cover. A lot of people liked it, so he started doing album covers for other bands. And there's one of his right here. Definitely liked this one a lot. There's another one of his. I mean, he really has a way of like, kind of like this one kind of has sort of a macabre feel to it. At the same time, it has more of a nature kind of feel to it, more of like an ex more of like an existential kind of feel. You do see that here. Is, you know, you got these skeleton looking things, but you also have this owl, what appears to be like a rainbow. And then in the bottom, there's this elk. So he's very influenced by nature. I want to say he's from somewhere in the uh, Pacific Northwest. I want to say Oregon. Might be Washington, but I think he's from the state of Oregon. Did this for a band by the name of Vector. This is one of their albums. Here's one he did for a band, a band that I've actually liked. It's a recent band. It's a band called Eternal Champion. And he did this one. This one, as you can see, it is without a doubt influenced by Frank Frazetta. Without a doubt. But he definitely added his own spin to it. You know, it's not copied. It's He added his own aesthetic to it, you know, his own way of doing it. Yeah, you could tell it is influenced by Frazetta, but at the same time, you know, he brought his own thing to it. He really did. So, another one of his right here. Just again, if this video cuts out, I will be continuing with the next one shortly thereafter. It's another one of his. Yeah, I really like this stuff. Another album cover right here. This one kind of looks a lot like the Yellowstone Falls right here in Yellowstone. It's really what it reminds me of. And you know, like a snake in the background like that. Definitely like this stuff. There's a, uh, another one he did for a band, but he kind of designed it like a movie poster. I really like how he did that. This 
one right here is called the uh, the Night Creeper. And also, he really like he brought. It, it looks like kind of like a '70s movie poster. That's what I like about it. You know the way he did design that. Yeah. Another one of his right here. More of a landscape. But yeah, kind of a nice scene. Really like how he does landscapes as well. You know, definitely an artist that I think needs more recognition. Really great stuff. And the interesting thing about him is he's entirely self-taught as well. I think he may have received some art training now, but yeah, he was self-taught and uh, just really has, has a great style. I you know, really like his style a lot. So that's it for now. I'll be back with another video shortly. Thank you for watching.